Hey everyone, welcome back to another Zoom edition of our podcast. Like we said last week, COVID cases have been increasing, so we just decided to do Zoom. And I'm still kind of lazy, so <laughs> I decided let's just um, do a home recording this time. I am John. I'm Ariel. And this week we're going to be talking about something I think, I mean, it depends on who you are and like depends on like the type of business person you are, but it is always good to have one. And we're going to be talking about business plans, how to create one, um, different resources that you can use to create one and like what, and like what ways or like what information to put into it to kind of make it more effective because I mean, business plans, they're very important and vital to your business and they kind of set the stone or set the foundation of what, of where you want your business to go, how you want it to do, to traject in the future. And if you're looking for funding, it's definitely a good idea to have, you know? So I know Ariel, you're kind of, you kind of were meeting with someone and they said, oh, you need a business plan and you didn't have one. So it's like, now you're kind of in that space where it's like oh crap I have to make I have to make one now <laughs> I just I don't I know I didn't really see the importance even though I've made one in school and they talked about the importance of a business plan for some reason in my mind I was like eh, I know what I'm doing right and to be honest you I feel like in certain cases you don't really if you have a vision you have an idea sometimes just your natural grit and your natural vision will just get you through the beginning seeding stages of studying your business. But like when you're in the more like, okay, you need, you know, you need investments or you need this or you need that where you're in like the second or third year, definitely a business plan would be helpful to get investments to kind of set the stone of like, where is your business now? Where do you see it in the next five or 10 years? And you know, it, and it becomes more of like a business than it becomes a hobby. So, I mean, depending on where you are in your business, you can decide for yourself if you need a business plan or not. But I would, I would say just have one for the first, at least for the first year, kind of, you know, have it for at least, kind of create a business plan to kind of traject for the next five years and then, you know, make another one as your business grows or as things change, especially in this pandemic, things are changing. So you may have a different idea than what your original idea was. You know, it may not be in, you know, a retailer, it may be an online retailer, it may be an offline business, like things like that, just certain changes that could affect the overall projection in terms of revenue and sales of your business. And it can help you keep you focused because I know it's really easy to get sidetracked, especially starting a business and you don't if you especially if you don't have a clear vision of what you want to do you can start mm -hmm. doing a bunch of things which isn't exactly. the best idea you should have a clear vision you should have like at the beginning of the business plan they'll ask you your mission statement and you yeah. should always go back to that and john mm -hmm. will explain more because he's done like 150 page business plan for his school so <laughs> he's the expert today <laughs> exactly so i'm gonna go a little bit into it so basically for me because i'm in my like master's program in fashion merchandising and business management um part of my thesis project is to kind of create an overall like plan which you can use as your business plan so create like a uh create a fictitious business and just kind of create an overall plan for it. Basically we start off with, with my school, they start off with like the midpoint thesis, which is basically you have a proposal of what your business, fictitious business would potentially be. And then you kind of do preliminary research, you know, what's the market, what type of business it is, the business concept, locations, things like that. And then in the final, you know, stages of my schooling, we do the more directed studies courses where they give, where you go more in depth on those different categories that you presented in the midpoint thesis, which in, at the end of the school, of my school, I would at least have 200 pages worth of research, you know, marketing plans, visuals, guidelines, things like that, that can be my entire business plan for the next five years. There are, def there are definitely a bunch of resources that you can go to. Like there's this um, nonprofit organization called SCORE. Um, it's S-C-O-R-E dot org. We're gonna put the link in the bio. And you can like literally go on to those platforms, 
you know, get, get like, um, what is it? Business plan templates, where it kind of goes through different categories and different sections that you should find, do research about and um, find that those types of informations to kind of really build the foundation of your business. And it's a long process. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I'm sure Ariel, she's going through it right now. So she's kind of like, it's a lot of things, a lot of elements that she has to put into her business. So it's a long process and you definitely have to take time for it, but I think it's worth it in case, especially since if you don't have like a general idea or if you're pivoting a certain idea or if you just want to get investment, it's definitely a good idea to have um, in your overall planning when you start your business. And score.org um, where you can find the business templates. They also have free mentors mm -hmm. that can help you start your business plan. If you have any more questions after this podcast as well. Yeah. You, you could have a mentor on there, right? I have a mentor, not for a business plan, but just to kind of help me with mm -hmm. business questions. Cause there's a lot of things that go into it that I, has he been helpful? He told me I needed to do a business plan before I started spending any money. And I was like, um, too late. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm in it now. <laughs> right, and I, but I also think like, and don't get me wrong, Love Score. I think they have a great, great platform. But I also think like sometimes even in fashion or even just creative, sometimes it's just doing it, actually yeah. doing what you want to do in terms of your business and getting started right away, is kind of like good. And then like as you're building that, you can start the business plan and kind of make those plans as you go along. You know what I mean? But then again, like I've had experience in BCBG and then Neiman Marcus learning what customers were buying. So it's kind of my research for the business plan. Mm -hmm. So I knew ahead of time, but I think it's really beneficial, especially if you want to do something completely different and new that you haven't seen in fashion, you should do research and see like how customers will gravitate towards it. Yeah. And it's a, ton of research like I took a from one of my courses one of my directed studies courses I was mentioning that kind of goes in depth in my thesis project that I have to present which is basically my um my business plan um literally the bulk of my thesis project is my micro research so the micro research is basically like customer segmentation, the psycho, psychographs, like different locations that you would want to present your business at. Um, what's the market? What is fashion going? Like, where is the market of fashion? What is online e-commerce? Is it making a certain amount of money? What's the projections for that in the next five to 10 years? Like those types of research, like finding those types of assumptions, like you have these assumptions on what the business looks like and finding the research and the data to back it up in order to um in order to kind of yeah to back it up and to like show the i guess the um consumers or even like the investors or whoever that what you're trying to achieve is achievable you know so it's a lot and we're gonna go we're gonna kind of talk about each segment a little bit just to kind of give you a general idea so the first thing that you probably want to start with in your business plan. So first is the business plan. You're going to, you have an idea, you have this um, concept that's not necessarily, I would say it's not new to the industry, but it's more of like, okay, this is your personal business that you thought of that's unique to your idea. And this is something that you want to start. So the first thing you'll do is kind of create like a mission, like she said, a mission statement, a vision statement, and a business concept. So having those jot down and make it clear on what it is your business stands for. So for me, my business concept is an online retailer that sells emerging and um, established designers um, with the hopes of presenting more exclusive or inclusive fashion from for um plus size women age ranging from sizes um let's say four to 20. so that's kind of like the gist of like my concept but also going further and talking about like oh i'm as my vision for my business concept so my vision statement would be um my 
I would say the, the goal for Encarciobi, which is the name of my brand. So you want to state the name of your brand. My, the goal for Encarciobi is to create positivity and change in the fashion industry and show diverse and empower women through those diversities and those representation. So just having those ideals that you want to talk about or that you want to present will be very um, important for whoever's looking at your um, business plan, whether it's investors or just people that are interested in what you do, you know? Yeah. So okay. it's a, I'm go sorry. ahead, sorry. I was okay. going to say, there's also things online too. If you need to figure out a way of how to explain your business, mm -hmm. if you're not sure, there's like key words that people can find. I know Fashionary has this and I love their book about it um, mm -hmm. on how to create a business, but they'll have all these key words. Like if you're sustainable, are you a luxury brand, um, modern, contemporary, elegant, sophisticated, stuff like that. And those, and you can pick four key words and those will kind of help you figure out your mission statement too, if you're kind of confused and don't know where to start. Exactly. Yeah. Like, cause when I first, when I was first going through the entire thing, I was like, mission statement, a vision statement. Like, what is this? I don't, what am I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, I sell clothes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I, I can't go about saying that, but there's, you're kind of, in a sense, creating a story as to why you're creating, why you want to create this business. For me, my idea was I want to be able to represent all types of women through different, different diverse women in the retail market, because you see brands like Netta Porter, like Neiman Marcus, like all these like brands that, you know, are more so very powerful with their content they create beautiful content but you only see a, a specific representation whether it's white um or just skinny stick regular sized women and the girl especially through our experience me and ariel's experience through shopping at neiman market well not shopping but working at neiman markets understanding the customer the women that shop for these luxury goods, they are not, some of them are, but not all of them are like stick, skinny, size two, size three, white women. We have black women, we had Asian, we've had Indian, we've had, we've had more color, we had more colors than you would think. And then there's more body shapes. We had size twos, we had size zeros, but we also had size 10, size 12, size 14, even a size 20, like, there are, more diff there are more sizes that are buying these luxury goods. And so when you see these online platforms just only kind of show representation on one customer, it doesn't, seem, it doesn't seem fair to the other customer that wants to buy these things. It doesn't seem like they're, they're empowered to actually go into a Neiman Marcus or to a Saks because they're not, they don't fit the ideals of what it is. So that's what I want to, that's why I wanted to create it on, in Casiobi to kind of have, to kind of like, I guess, disrupt the status quo of what online luxury is and kind of create something where all women of all types, all colors, shapes, whatever, whoever you are can come and shop and feel comfortable and empowered and see themselves on social media, on the website and things like that. I'm still young as a when it comes to my business so still building that out but like the idea and the men, the mission and the vision is right there so that could definitely that goes into all of my planning so um so Ayo, what what about you when it comes to like the mission vision and like business concept what what was what is your original idea or what is it that you have thought of in order to kind of create those um that message so a great starting point for me was figuring out what I didn't like about the industry mm -hmm. and how it's become it to me, the industry is more fast fashion. It's the, even the high end designers are just whipping out collection after collection after collection. And you kind of lose like the beauty of fashion and like mm -hmm. what really goes into it. And it's the creativity. And now you're just seeing the same thing over and over again, but it's a different print. It's a different color, but it's, and they're, it's not the same. Like, I don't get the same feeling I used to get when I was younger looking at these runway shows. It's just like, right. okay, I've seen that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Whatever. And then Chanel, it's like, okay, wow. There's like 150 looks. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of fashion as being a wearable work of art. 
Like I want people to look at fashion that, wow, like I love this. I can wear this forever. It's not like, oh, this is just going to be in my closet. I'm going to wear it once and that's it. And then I'm going to give it away or just keep it. I don't know. You don't need this absurd amount of clothes. I mean, yes, I have an absurd amount of clothing <laughs> and shoes and handbags and I get it, but like, I don't need, I want pieces that'll last me like a lifetime, not, you know, just like, yeah, you get it. So, <laughs> so I, that's how I started my business plan is what frustrated me. So that can kind of help you guys too. Like what makes you want to create this business? Like what pissed you off? What? Um, inspired you kind of go from there so my mission statement is wearable works of art defined by simple elegance mm, so. love that <laughs> very simple very simple yeah. clear concise you know definitely straight to the point mm -hmm. but then keeping up with the modern age so it's going to be sustainable it's going to be well at first mainly online and how am i i'm going to ask the questions okay how can i stay in sus ah how could i be sustainable yet mm. luxury. Cause I know when people hear sustainable, they think, I don't think you think of good connotations with it. I know I yeah. don't. When somebody, yeah, it, when I hear sustainable, I hear like. Recycled clothes or yes. recycled fabrics, used yes. fabrics, things like that. Mm -hmm. But then I've actually done research and found certain types of fabrics that I can use that are sustainable, eco-friendly, but feel the same as silk that are still cotton and feel luxurious. So you're mm -hmm. not getting itchy, scratchy, monochromatic, you know, sustainable fabrics, but you're getting, more. so I'm doing research to keep it modern. And the same yeah. with digital. How can I set myself apart from everyone else? The Netta Porter, uh, Neiman Marcus, you know, uh, forward, that's a- Forward, yeah. Forward. <laughs> But so I ask myself these types of questions to better help my business plan and to keep asking those questions while I write it. Cause in the business plan, they ask questions like, Oh, how are you going to stand out? Who are your competitors? What are you doing different? Why should mm -hmm. people shop with you? And you need to always ask yourself those questions. Why? Exactly. And, and, sometimes those questions can be hard to kind of answer. So for me, luckily I was able to like find different resources or different like New, um, articles like you can go on businessoffashion.com find all that information like who your customer is the different statistics and data that can back up what you're trying to build you can even go on like consulting firms like McKinley I think it's McKinsey or McKinley um, McKinley and Bain um, consulting groups well McKinley's one McKinley and Co is one consulting group and then there's Bain and Co consulting group. I know Bain and McKinley, they've done different like research data with um, business of fashion, also with um, other luxury like platforms. I know they did like a collaboration with Moda Operandi just to kind of see different data for their online luxury business and things like that. So you can find those articles or even those like, um, like those little like e-booklets that are for free to kind of um, go over their research. It's a bit of a read. I'm not going to lie to you. It's a bit of a read and probably some of it will go over your head. I know it did for me, um, but it's definitely useful. Um, a lot of, I've like referenced in my business plan, a lot of those research findings from business of fashion, from McKinley, from Bain and Co. Like, and uh, it's worked in my benefit because now doing all this research, I have, the um the understanding of the industry i have a huge understanding of the industry and i may not know everything but like i know how this works i know how that works and i know how to kind of like put it together so you're essentially researching your industry so that definitely helps a lot especially with like these free articles that are readily available some of them are not free but if you're in school you can get them for free um, Ariel and I know about that. <laughs> um, and, but if also like there are ways you can probably like find it and just download it for free, you would have to do a lot of research in order to do that. I know I did have to like really dig deep and find it somewhere, but it's, it's accessible. You'll be able to find it. And even if it's like 2016, if it's within the, if it's within the 10 year, um, frame, like the 10 year frame, like it was made in 2010, it's still relevant because 
a lot of the times information kind of well over over the years so it's kind of still relevant so you you know still use it and still get a little bit of information but kind of like look at what's current because it may not talk about technology it may talk about something totally different and then now we're talking about technology so kind of just take out just kind of like look at it and see what are the similarities and kind of build it into your own especially during the coronavirus too because things have definitely changed and yep. who knows what's going to happen afterwards but it's good to see what's going on during right especially right even like business fashion they have like a what is it called something a fashion uh, it's like an e-booklet that they made with um with mckinsey i think with mckinley or one, one, one of those names one of those big consulting firms <laughs> out in New York, <laughs> but they made like a huge booklet. Every year they do like a year, like a year in fact, I think it's like a year in fashion 2021. They just released it the beginning of this year and they kind of project what's going to happen in the fashion industry um, in 2021. So it's available now. You can download it on Business of Fashion. If you have an account, a free account, you don't have to buy the, you don't have to, I don't think you have to pay for it. Um, cause I certainly did not pay for it. <laughs> so you can download it and like read it and kind of get an idea. Like what is your industry going to look like for 2021 and create your business plan based on that. So once you get your business, um, concept, your mission statement all down now is the hard part, which is the market research and baby you have to write a lot of research. You have to do a lot of research. Luckily I was in school, so I was graded on this to do it. But if I was not in school and I had to do this, I would have quit. I would have been like, listen, let me, just, let me just do this on my own without writing all this crap. And then we'll come back to it later once I find the findings. Cause I'm more of like a doer than an actual, edu like a, I'm, I'm not very much a, I like school, I like the idea of school, but I feel like I'm more of a like, I have to do something in order for me to kind of like understand it than to do like this research, find all this information and put it in a booklet. It's just, it doesn't, it didn't make sense to me. Are you kind of the same Ariel? Do you do that? Yeah. Um, uh -huh. I think I would really take it, like do a lot of that work when I have investors or if I'm presenting it in front of like a buyer or something. Mm -hmm. But for right now, it doesn't yeah. be necessary to me because I'm not looking for an investor at this moment. I mean, you're more than welcome to give me money, but okay. um, I don't know yet what I use it for. So it probably wouldn't it be the smartest choice on your end. <laughs> but, I, but, I, yeah. but I do think like even the huge amount of research, like you don't have to do the entire market research. You can do something totally simple where you just talk about your industry. What's, what are the changes? What are the, the pros, what are the cons, things like that. So I'm gonna go a little bit deeper um, just to kind of give you that. So you have your mission statement, you have your vision statement and you have your business concept. So that's squared away. The next thing that you're, is your market, next thing you have to talk about is your market research. And one of the segments that they have that, that I went through based on school is the micro environment. So the micro environment has different, um, has diff like seven, I think, or maybe five sections, which is they classified as like the pestles um, environment. So it's like the econ economic factors, the, um, I think it's the social factors. So it goes out in like different, like P-E-S-T-L. Or yeah, I think that's how it goes. So P is the, what is it? I think it's the, um, sorry, give me one second. Let me try to figure out what that is. Political. P is the political factors. E is the economic factors. S is the social economic factors. T is the techno technological factors. And then the L is the legal factors. So political, trade wars. In fashion, there's a lot, there's a trade, there was a trade war that was going on yes, um, last year because of the whole Trump in, you know, administration with their fight with China and things like that, um, especially with the, especially with COVID-19 originating over there. And there was just an all out war where 
um, China was charging so much money for tariff taxes. And tariff taxes are basically if you're importing product, like say you're importing like a dress from a designer and it's made in China, um, you have to pay duty taxes on that garment, which is normally about like seven to 10%, which is not a lot, but because of the US and China trade war, the amount went up to 20%, or I think 14 to 20% around that, which is a lot of money if you spent, say you spent $5,000 on this garment and it's all coming from China, 10% of that for tariff taxes is $500. And that's a little, oh, no, sorry, 20% of that is, well, 10 is $500. And then 20% is like a lot more than that. How much is that? I think that's like, I want to say like, not, I don't know if it's like, a th- I don't think it's a thousand, but we're not math people, so I don't know. But it's a lot of money. <laughs> but you can keep up to date on this with Women's Wear Daily as well. I know yes. I just got an article about what's currently happening because I know there's a lot of, um, oh, what is it? Not slaves. I want to say poor working conditions. There you labor, go. yeah, labor yeah. conditions. That yeah. definitely affects trade off, trade wars as well. I know that's going on right now. Yeah. So yeah. like if, so politically there's a trade war between different countries and because of that, they can increase, I mean, I'm not, I'm just going based off what I've researched and things like that. They, because we're not necessarily in business with them or the United States is not trying to be in business with them because of whatever reason, the tariff taxes could increase or it could be more. The reason why the Trump administration or the reason why any administration wants to create those connections is to make sure that the small businesses that are patronizing those different um, imports, it makes money for the US as well as it makes money for the country that we're working with. So when there's a war or like a trade war between the, the country, no one's benefiting from it and we're losing money, spending exuberant amount of money on those, on those duty taxes. And then um, sometimes even poor quality conditions could happen within those countries as well. Just like you said, with the labor, with the labor conditions in certain countries like Bangladesh, like wherever, it could, be a, it could be a huge issue where if the United States were to know about that, they could be potentially even liable or even get into huge trouble because of that. So I like having you. this information on, having this political information on whether whatever administration that we're in, um, knowing that they're able to kind of um, protect us, the small business owners, as well as protect the other country, we'll have a great um, partnership with those countries that we're importing our product from, and it will lower the amount of tariff duty taxes, which will not eat into our bottom line, because that could essentially eat into your bottom line too. So that's, that's what political wars, and there are many other factors that can go into those factors uh, or into the segment. So the next one is economic. So what's the industry, like where's the industry at economically? What, how much is money is it making? What, how's it doing as a business? Are they losing money? Are they making money? How, what's the trajectory on like how much percentage will this industry make over the next five years? Will it go by 5%? Will it go by 2%? Will it go by 0%? Things like that. So you wanna have that information, which is readily available on all these, you know, platforms, B of A, um, Business of Fashion, McKinley, all those different um, uh, like research resources. And then there's S, social economic um, like uh, factors. So basically this one's kind of easy. It's just kind of like what, like how, like what are the customers looking for when it comes to this? Like where, where exactly are these like high-end customers shopping like are they in los angeles are they in la um what's the buying power so like how much money did the united states make in terms of like income what's the population in terms of like income um how much the population is making when it comes to income um last year i think because of covid19 um the income like factor was i think it was less than a less than a billion dollars when normally it's like a trillion dollars because everyone's working you know what i mean so because a lot of people weren't working i think it went down to like a billion because there's so many people out of work although they were getting 
um, maybe they're getting unemployment, but unemployment doesn't factor into those income. So that's a huge factor. Um, even just like talking about like, um, like what is this high end customer who is making so much money? Is she able to shop? Like, is she, um, like, what is she? What does she do? What are her like psychographics? Like, what is her like, um, characteristics? Is she an online shopper? Is she an in-store shopper? Does she require like that visceral touch or that feel? Just those types of information to kind of like um, put into your market research. Even like where are, they? like who are they? Are they Chinese shoppers? Are they American shoppers? Are they European shoppers? Like who are they? That's basically the social economic factor of that. And then that can answer your customer profile, which will be done afterwards, like gender, age, income exactly what she does everything yeah. yeah and with that there's like psycho psycho psychological factors the benefit factors even the geological factors like where you think she's located um things like that is she married is she single is she making this amount of income is she um does she have kids you know it's kind of like a projection you're kind of like getting all the data and kind of understanding who is this customer and then just kind of making it up based on the data that you've found, if that makes sense. You're trying to prove that what you're wanting to do and what business you're trying to bring into the industry is going to work. That's what you're proving here with this business plan. Yeah. It's a lot that goes into it, but I, it definitely is worth it. So with that, so we went from P, we went to E, and we went to S. Um, pastel. So we'll go to L. So, oh, sorry, T. Technolo technological factors. Basically, it's like how technologically is your business going to be? So is it like, or how advanced is technology in your industry? So AI, which is artificial intelligence, augmented, augmented reality, mobile, people are using mobile apps to shop now, online shopping, like what, based on your customer information, based on your industry, what technology do you think makes this business profitable or viable? Um, so if you're, you don't necessarily have to put like, I put AI, like um, what is AI? I, artificial intelligence and augmented reality. I put that into that, into my business plan because with online e-commerce, a lot of people, a lot of retailers are doing that. They're creating a, you know, mobile app where you can literally put like a picture frame you can take a picture of yourself on the mobile app and pick a clothing based in the retailer and see it see yourself pictured wearing it in front of your mirror like that's augmented reality and then there's certain different like you know um technology that they're using to kind of like see you wear it before you actually buy it so you know what you're buying so it's definitely for definitely for like a new emerging brand. Obviously, you don't have the budget to do that because it's a, it's very expensive. But it's also good to have just in case when you do grow, you yeah. can implement that in there. And then there's also um, for artificial intelligence. I know a lot of designers are doing um, video games too, since video games is extremely popular right now. Right. Design mm -hmm. clothes for those. Mm -hmm. I know there's. I know there was one job I was looking into where they were saying they were going to make 3D clothes, like in the like artificial intelligent clothing, and I was like, "That's so weird." But I it's funny you dream. say that. It's so funny you say that because there's this brand that I or this company that I've shopped with before, Luisa Via Roma. They're based in uh, Florence, Italy, but they sell globe. They sell their clothing globally, but they work with a bunch of different designers like Gucci, Saint Laurent, all those high-end brands, and they sell like really, really like exclusive, like ex a very expensive product. And I remember, and you know, I've shopped their sales before, and I've bought some of the some of the clothes that they have from the different designers that they curate. And they reached, they sent an email to all their customers saying like, oh, we have this game, this new like fashion game where basically you're styling a avatar of either yourself or just a random avatar in the designers um, that they carry for that season. And based on how many likes you get, you get certain like rewards points and those rewards points can go towards buying, getting certain like, you know, 
I guess, what is it? Exclusive, like, what are those things called? You know how, like, Neiman's, they have, like, those rewards. Like, you get, you get like, perks. Like, oh, okay. you know, like, alterations, like, for this amount of points. Or maybe get a free product. Or get exclusive deals on how to get in the sale before the sale actually starts. Like, things like that. So, I mean, though, that's really cool. Um, and then there is the legal. I think the legal is the last one. The legal um, factor is basically what I put like, it, there's not a lot of legal situations that go into other than like trademarking, um, which is what we talked about in our last episode. Business um, license. Business license, um, counterfeiting. How do you battle that? Because there's a lot of designers that once they get to a certain mainstream in their in their career, they start getting, you know, people copying their designs or even copying their intellect, like copying their intellectual property as well as copying, um, making counterfeits, you so know. H and M, Forever Twenty One, Zara. Exactly. Etsy. But even but even if you go to like downtown or somewhere in like the like outskirts of like china like they have like counterfeit like chanel dior bags like that look real and they sell it for the price of what it really is but it's not actual or it's not an actual real chanel bag it's a fake bag so they probably made it for like what 12 bucks and they're selling it for ten thousand dollars because it looks like the actual bag that chanel or whoever would sell in the actual re retail store but consumers don't don't really know that they just see oh it's a Chanel bag it looks so real it feels nice and you're selling it for this amount okay it's cheaper than what it is online I'm gonna buy it you should always smell your bag always smell your bag you should always even if it's a, when it's a luxury brand look if they have like a, those um uh, identification authenticity. authenticity cards yeah. that's a dead giveaway because if they don't have that then you know it's a fake yeah and like they can say, oh, we lost it. We can't find it. Then don't buy it. No. Then don't buy it. Don't waste your money if they can't. Because then, if you buy a luxury bag, like buy a luxury bag, and then you want to sell this bag, and they don't have the authenticity code, you're not gonna get you're not gonna get money off of that because it's they're gonna say it's, it's fake. It may be very real. You just don't have the authentic authenticity code or a, a card. They're just not gonna rebuy it from you. So you might as well just make sure that they have that. So that's part of counterfeiting. So just having those little legal things um, factored into your business. So what will prevent you from doing that? And then um, there's a whole bunch of things that you want that we're gonna like that you want to add to that. Um, the the micro environment is the very much mostly important part because it goes into your industry in depth. You want to know all this information. Like I said, the political factors, the economic factors, social economic factors. Um, the technological factors and the legal factors. You want to go into all of that because that's going to set the stone of like, where is your industry at and how does your business fit in that market space? And then the next is kind of like the micro um, environments, which, which is, huh? Is that what you just said? No, the micro, not macro. Oh, you said micro at first and then you said it again. Oh, my bad. So the first one was the macro. I don't know, maybe I said macro environments. Now we're going into the micro environments, which is basically you're gonna segmentate your customer base. So based on the information that you got from your social economic factors, you're gonna go in depth on who your customer is. So you're gonna wanna have a primary customer, tertiary, uh, sorry, primary, secondary, and tertiary. You can have a primary and secondary, that's fine. But just to be on the safe side, tertiary, especially in luxury, like you want to have different, you want to have a different customer groups. So for me, and I'm sure, if, well, not, maybe not for everybody, but for me, my primary customer are millennials and my secondary customers are Gen Z's and my tertiary customers are the baby boomers. So the millennials are, sh are the ones that are shopping the most right now. There's very few of them at this moment, but because of the population and things like that, but millennials, are the main target for my business. Secondary are the Gen Zs, they're the, the ages between 18 to 25. They're not shopping as much, but they do have, and be, mostly because some of them are 18 year olds and they don't have the income, 
but and then some of them are like probably starting in their careers and you know they don't have the income to even buy a luxury bag but we use that we use their um their demographic as more of like an aspirational shopper meaning that they they want to be able to strive to shop for a luxury bag or a, a a high-end dress or a $10,000 dress once they get the income for that. That's what we call aspirational shoppers. Um, And that's basically what Gen Z's are. Some Gen Z's maybe get income from their parents to kind of- Social media. Or social media um, to kind of, you know, buy these things. I know for me personally, like when I wanted something, I would always ask my parents to like buy it for me, whether it was, even if it was expensive or not. Um, So- that's um that was when i was younger i mean but um so that's kind of you can factor into that you know um i know ariel you've had experiences with this as well where you've had you know family members buy you certain things or your mom is a huge shopper so you kind of work with her on that so it it those factors kind of like go into you know this type of customer so not necessarily they're going to be shopping a lot but you have they have the mindset of oh i want this as I get older, as I make money, or they may just save for whatever many years to buy this particular item. Yeah. And they're so always, way. oh, sorry. They're always no looking to, like, I know when I was younger and I'd ask my mom for things too, like there were some things that were just, you know, out of budget, like Dior, Chanel, stuff like that. They're mm-hmm. really up there. And who wants to spend that much money for a kid? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but as like a millennial back then too, like I'm aspiring to one day be able to afford it. So you're, they're still targeting and trying to make it more useful too. Mm -hmm. Um, to one day get me as a customer when I'm able to afford it. Right. Exactly. And then you go into the tertiary customer. So it's basically, if you guys are in our age group, it's your parents. <laughs> basically, your parents who are able to afford it. They have millions of dollars or whatever the case may be. And they're just like, oh, spend $50,000. That's just a cakewalk. That's like a dollar to me. <laughs> like that kind of customer. Because they've built their wealth. They've invested well. They look twice before they look at the price. They, they don't look twice at the price. They know like price is not an option. Price is not a thing for them. They can spend however much they want on anything because they have the means. Now, the reason why I put this as my tertiary customer, this customer profile doesn't shop as often as Gen Z's or millennials. They may shop once or twice a year. Yes, they spend a whole lot, but the whole option is to have multiple customers shopping at a specific time. So when you have these three customers, the millennials, they shop maybe one item a season, maybe one or two items a season. Gen Z's, they may ask their parents one time to shop for the to buy this bag for them or they may save up to buy this bag but think of those customers buying one time think of them buying a buying one time well okay let me say it in this way millennials yes they buy one time but they buy one time each season um and that kind of accumulates to um so say if they have like 10,000, so you have 10,000 like millennials that are shopping that buy one product per season. That's a lot of, that's a lot of income coming there right there. Now, the tertiary customer, the baby boomers, they buy one time. They don't really, and they're very brand specific. So if you don't have their brand, they're not going to look at you. If you're not interested in their, if they're, if they, if their product if, cause because they're in this like age group where it's like they're getting older, they're not really looking for anything in particular. If they, um, if you don't have the specific category that they like or what they're looking for, then they're not going to really shop with you. And it's kind of hard to get them to kind of shop more than once. And because they're not technologically savvy, they're not going to really shop <laughs> the way that you really are trying to advance into shop, like shopping online or shopping through a mobile app. It can be hard for those type of customers to kind of get with the program on that. See, this is like completely different research than I have. I mean, I didn't go into debt into research. I mean, this is just from personal experience, but mm-hmm. the baby boomers were my customers. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. They're, they're the only people who shopped high end and they came in way more than once or twice a year and they would spend a lot. But think of, but they just, yes, they spend a lot, but think of it this way. They're coming in 
they're coming in to buy a specific brand. Like at, D, at Neiman Marcus, they have those customer, they have those designers that um, the baby boom is shopping for. Chanel, Escada, Dior, Gucci, Louis, um, Louis Vuitton, Yves Saint Laurent, like those brands. Now, if you're a brand like mine or a brand like Moda Operande that don't have those, you know, high ultra luxury brands, but kind of cater towards the new emerging brands, yeah, you'll get bits and pieces of those, you know, tertiary customer, the more, um, what is it called? The baby boomer customer wanting to shop a little bit, but they're looking for ultra luxury, ultra high end brands that are named, like are known brands. They're not looking for newer emerging brands. Sometimes they're not look, like, sometimes they're not even like shopping like that because it's like they're in their fifties. It's like, what am I have to impress people for? It just depends on who the person is. Okay. My, that's based on what, what I found. That's based on they're what 50, I found. So they're just done. <laughs> Some of them are, you know, you'll be surprised. Like my aunt, she's in her sixties and she's not done, but there are people that are in their fifties that have been shopping luxury goods that don't find the value in it anymore based on my research. No, mm -hmm. 50 is like the new 30. Come 50, on. Bro. <laughs> Have you seen like 50? Okay. I feel like in our mind, 50 year olds are like little grannies with like their walkers already. And they're not. They're like Jennifer Lopez. Are you kidding me? <laughs> right. But not everyone's a Jennifer Lopez. That's the thing. <laughs> a majority of them are. I mean, like, no. <laughs> people look so much younger now than they ever did before. And I feel like people in their 50s and 60s are wearing more of these contemporary brands mm -hmm. and are dressing way more youthful than they are. I feel like we're thinking of people in Escada where they have their matching cardigan with their shirt and their dress pants and then their, you know, comfortable loafers and that's it. No. <laughs> but do you honestly think that there's so many people that are 50s, 60s looking like Jennifer yes. Lopez. Well, no, I'm not Jennifer Lopez, but they're not dressing like. But you but designs, holding. but some of the designs that designers are creating are are expensive that a fifty year old multi millionaire would be able to afford. But they're designing them for a millennial Gen Z customer. Why is that? Well, the contemporary bands, the stuff that's like, you know, three to four hundred dollars per piece. But I'm talking about like the luxury high end designers. But that's what I'm saying. Like, because in the last collection from Dior that we saw that you didn't like the music for, it, but you liked the, the collection itself. To me, I, it didn't scream a 50, 60 year old woman. It screamed millennial Gen Z. Hmm. No, because you can see. See, somebody who's really into fashion and mm -hmm. appreciates Dior and Chanel and stuff, they'll see the pieces that they can then pull from and wear into their closet. They're not going to style it like they do on the runway. That's just for a show. Okay. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I get it. But I'm just going on based off my, what I found on my, uh, on my research. Now, there's a bunch of different... So I just choked on something. I don't know what it was. <laughs> but there's a bunch of different uh, research that you can find that have various different information that you can use towards your assumptions. But based on my assumption, I found that a lot of old people aren't shopping like that. They ain't trying to buy, they ain't shopping like that, like that. And then what I like to say too, this is just research on uh, research that's out there. Your brand can change that. That is what my brand is going to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, definitely your brand can change that. Yes. Definitely. Once you get it on, if you get it on the right person, even like influencer marketing, that definitely helps with trying to get your customer who is known for not shopping like that, maybe, um, to, actually shop, to actually shop frequently and buy the product. You can even change the model of your business where it's not seasonal, but drops. So like every three months, luxury goods are being dropped for the customer to shop frequently. So don't think of this research as limitations. Mm -hmm. Think of it as ways to change the industry or just so you know what you're getting into. But these are in no way like restrictions on what you can and can't do. You can yeah. change how things you, are. Exactly. And each business is different. My business just so happens to be geared towards more so the millennial Gen Z. Maybe a little bit of the like, um, what you call it, the baby boomers. But mostly the millennials for sure. 
Um, so the technology, the, the artificial intelligence, those are things that I want to implement into my business. Now, if your business is like Ariel's where she's gearing towards the baby boomers, which create, you know, have the bulk of the money to shop for her product, then you have to kind of change your strategy a little bit. Even though it says, you know, this research, research says this customer base is not gonna shop that much or is not gonna buy as much as what you predicted or hoped for, there's still opportunities to kind of change that. So yeah, don't let me limit it. Let me, don't let me limit y'all. I'm just saying, this is what <laughs> I found. Don't shoot the messenger, you know, just saying, trying to help y'all. But um, so that's that, and that's for the customer base. Then you kind of go into your competitors. Who are your competitors? Um, why are they your competitors? Now picking your, so you have to pick maybe six different competitors, especially for me, I picked six different competitors. I picked three that are my direct competitors, and then I picked three that are my indirect. And that's kind of like my um, way of kind of understanding who am I competing against? And how can I... Um, stand out. Stand out, yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. Like for me, my competitors are Forward by Elise Walker, just gonna put it out there. Forward by Elise Walker, Five Story New York, um, and Luisa Villaroma, just because they have their own like private label collection, they're kind of more edgier when it comes to like new up and coming designers, as well as producing or in show, showing, showcasing like more emerging designers. So that's kind of like where I feel like I fit in. Um, and then like my indirect are like, I don't know, like Moda Operande, um, yeah, Moda Operande, Nether Porter, and probably like another brand that I, or, well, I have, I have three direct, but I have two indirect. So I have to find a third one. But yeah, that's kind of I'm where sorry. it's at. Hmm? Yeah, just take a key point from what you're wanting to do for your business and find a competitor that way. Like, what are they doing similar? So is it by price point? So for mm -hmm. me, luxury, like Valentino, Alexander McQueen, Chloe, they have like that same price point. Um, if it's design, like what kind of design are you doing? Um, is it... Luxury, contemporary, modern, mm -hmm. um, active. Even the customer base too. Like you can base it on the customer that you're trying yeah. to attract. You know? um, online, digital. Yeah. Those are mm -hmm. just ways to look into your competitors. Yes. And then the final step when it comes to the market research and this, this, this section of the market research for your business plan is to find what is your competitor advantage. So what what in your what is it about your business that makes you stand out that competes against your competitors so for me wanting to um create a online retail store that showcases diverse women from um ethnicity to sizes and create content around that as well as have product that is based on that too so having different si different um sized product so it's not just regular straight sizing it can be plus size obviously we're trying to work out the kinks on that because not all designers create plus size just yet but there is an opportunity for that and then with my private label to kind of create that for those women as well as having other designs embedded in that platform if that makes sense um so that's kind of like the advantage, the content creation, like co creating content that is based on the change and positivity of fashion to kind of be more inclusive, diversity and empowering. Um, even, um, so my, I, my business is solely online. So my advantage would be being an only online store as well as having mobile app, um, hopefully in the next year or two and other types of like, venture into other types of technology. So like AI, augmented reality, contactless shopping. Like there's this thing that I saw in um, Business of Fashion where it's called, where they use contactless in, um, uh, shopping, which I find very interesting. And I wanna do more research on that before we go into that topic, but it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So just being more technologically savvy compared to my competitors. Obviously I'll need a lot of money to do that, but you know, we'll, it's, it's, it's being a small brand and being someone that's, um, or being a brand that's not necessarily known, it's a good way to 
beat the competition and to be recognized for that. And then um, when you're doing this, you have to go by that one rule when you're figuring this out. It's called the SWAT rule. SWAT, yep. Mm -hmm. so SWAT strength, analysis. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's strengths, weaknesses, the O. Opportunities. Opportunities and, and the threats. Threat, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you need to just, you need to figure out what's your weakness. So John, what's your weakness? Um, less, I'm not a known brand. And that will be the same with me. Why is someone going to spend luxury prices on someone they don't know? Mm -hmm. What's a threat? Uh, saturation in the marketplace. Exactly. And then mm -hmm. for me, it's like, are people really going to buy high end still, especially after coronavirus and everyone's wearing sweats, is there really going to be a buyer? Exactly. And um, then opportunities. Go. Opportunities would be like being technologically savvy, like how I stated in my um, competitor advantage, com competitive advantage, like your opportunities are ways to, you can see yourself shining against your competitors. competitors. So, yeah. and then strengths. Um, one of my strengths that I put in was that I want to represent all women, not just the specific type, but all women. Yeah, and not the, sorry, not the fashion industry standard of beauty, because that exactly. is so outdated. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So outdated. Very, very outdated. And yeah, and then you can go into like where you, where you see yourself positioning those brands. I'm sure the template will show you that if you go on the score.org. Um, it does. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And then um, you can go into like what, you, what your marketing plan is, what your visual plan is, creating your, your guidelines. You can, and there's a whole bunch of things that you have to talk about, even financials. Now, I want to bring someone on to kind of talk about those, these financial, the financial aspect of it, because it is, I'm not a math person and or you're not a math person. So to kind of like talk about finances and like how to project and all that stuff, I'm just going to be like, oh, geez, I can't. <laughs> So maybe we can put a pin on this conversation and maybe yeah. down the line bring someone in to talk about the financial parts of building your business, regardless of what business it is. We can have someone be on that. Yeah, because I so, definitely need that because I don't know. Until I have like a, my first collection and I can figure out what's like selling and how much things cost, can I then project things? But until then, I'm kind of like clueless and... So that Same. would be great. So we can all learn together. <laughs> Same. Like I was taking my financial course last semester as part of like my thesis project. And I was just like, like my teacher was like, I had to literally every week, me and her would have like a, she had office hours. So I would be in her office hours for like literally two hours and we would do it through Zoom um, because it's an online program that I'm doing. So we would be on Zoom. She would try to, give me all the information and give me all the instructions on like what the financials are for and like what I should factor in and things like that. And it just still went through my head. I don't even know what she was talking about. And I, even though I passed the course, I still don't know what she was talking about. And I'm just like, okay, I can't go into this with y'all. I need you to, I need to get a professional. So we'll try to, I have someone in mind, but we'll try to see if we can get that person to kind of be on the zoom call with us so we can okay. give you more accurate information on that. So that way you guys can take away or make notes and, you know, do what you need to do in order to get your business started, you know? And I know this is a lot of information that we have thrown at you. So we will end it at this because yes. you have a lot of research. So again, it's score.org and they have free business templates or business plan templates along with how to get your business started and a bunch of other articles, blogs, webinars on mm -hmm. how to get your small business started, what to do during coronavirus and everything that you could possibly need. So I mm -hmm. highly recommend checking it out. Mm -hmm. You can also even like, like she, we said in the beginning, you can get a mentor on there so they can like kind of go through the process with you. So if you don't know anything about financials when it comes to creating your business, I'm sure the mentor knows so they yeah. can <laughs> definitely help you with that if you don't have someone to do it for you already. For sure. So, yeah. So yeah, that we're going to end it right here just because <laughs> we know we threw a whole bunch and we don't want to over exhaust you guys, but we thank you so much for listening to this episode. Please, please, please like, share, comment. If you're on YouTube, like, share, subscribe, 
click that notification bell just to kind of like watch the video. But if you're just listening to us through either Spotify, Apple, Apple Podcasts, or any other podcasting system, please just like share, like it, things like that. Comment, create a review, um, whatever to show us t- some type of support and give us some information on how we could be better as we're podcasting and as we're trying to provide some type of informational system or whatever to help you guys um achieve your goals whatever way that looks like yes and go ahead that's it yeah that's it all right well thank you all so much we love you um my name is john you can find me at john no or j nuenko on instagram which is j-a-y-n-w-a-n-k-w-o and then I'm Ariel Campbell. If you for oh ah. <laughs> on Instagram, it's Ariel V Campbell. You can also think of like mermaid soup with a V in the middle. So there you go. Right. So thank you guys. <laughs> Have a good day. We're out. Bye. Bye.